looking in the book of Galatians, and today we'll try to understand what Paul is asking in Galatians chapter 3, verse 4. Paul made a comment one time in the scriptures. He said, those of us who are ambassadors for Christ are a savor of life unto life to those who believe and a savor of death unto death to those who disbelieve and who is adequate for these things. And you're not looking at anybody who's adequate for these things. But God has made us adequate. And to be able to tell somebody that they are saved, who do you think you are to be able to say that? Do the Mormons tell people they're saved? Do the Jehovah's Witnesses tell people they're saved? Do the Roman Catholics tell people they're saved? Do the Jewish people tell people that are saved? Does, does everybody have some way of going to heaven and meeting with God? Yes. Who gives them the right to say what it is? Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. Now that's what I say. What gives me the right to say that? And to say that if you don't come through Jesus, you're on your way to hell, who has the right to say that? These are awesome truths. To be able to tell somebody that they are born again and saved and right before God, or that they're not. And Paul is dealing with a group of people that may or may not be right before God. And now I'm trying to understand what he was saying to them. And it's an awesome thing to try to um, understand the mind of Paul and to explain what he was trying to say. And then to unite it with the rest of the scriptures becomes somewhat difficult at times. So we're going to look at <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look at Paul's experience with the Galatian cities and what happened in those cities. And then we're going to take a look at um, what some people would call the other side of the coin and see how all of this relates. And it's my desire that the Spirit of God would be our teacher and that uh, we would be built up in the faith that's taught to us in the scriptures. Allow me to pray before we begin. Father, we do ask that you would grant to us understanding in this book. What a wonderful privilege is ours to have your word in our own language, to be indwelt by your spirit, to know the true and the living God and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have sent to become the propitiation for all those who trust in him. To know that our savior is no longer lying in a tomb, but has been raised from the dead and is at your right hand awaiting the time when you will send him to come back for your people. As we contemplate all these truths, our minds are overwhelmed, our hearts are filled with joy, and we give thanks to you for the wisdom you've granted to us, for the opportunity to know your word, and for the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. And we ask now that your spirit would teach us that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we would walk pleasing in his sight by the power of your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christ. <clears throat> 
Now, if our beloved Pastor Bryant were here, what do you think would be the next comment he would say? As he would probably turn to the right and get all excited. His next comment would be, he's all you need. Christ, he's all you need. I don't know how many times I've heard him say that. But it's been quite a few. The question is, do we really believe that? Is there something else besides Christ that we need? Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 3. And in verse 1, he says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he then who provides you with the Spirit and work miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Do you see a contrast that Paul is bringing up in Galatians 3 verses 1 through 5? He talks in verse 2 about the Spirit being received by works or by faith. In verse 3, he talks about beginning by the Spirit and being perfected by the flesh. And in verse 5, he talks about God providing you with the Spirit and working miracles among you. Does he do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? There seems to be two avenues by which an individual might receive the blessings of God, and they are the works of the law or by faith. So what's the answer? Is a man made right before God? Is a man justified by works? Or is a man justified by faith? The answer is, a man is justified by faith, right? Then explain the verse that's in your bulletin. So then you see a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. How can those two things be reconciled? Is a man justified by faith alone? Or is a man justified by works and not by faith alone? For your knowledge and enjoyment, the verse in your bulletin is out of the Bible as well. It's in the book of James. Paul asked, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? I decided to see what things the Galatians suffered. So I turned back to Acts chapter 13, where Paul is on his first missionary journey. And in Acts chapter 13, we see he's set apart and that they go to the island of Cyprus. They have an encounter with some people there. And John leaves them 
And then it says in verse 13, Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the official, the synagogue official sent to them, say, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. And Paul goes through some history of the nation of Israel coming to David the king and talking about the resurrection and that David was not talking of himself because he underwent decay but that he was talking of someone else and that Paul presented that someone else as Jesus Christ. And after it was all said and done, it says, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. So now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds... They were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. So here we see the first persecution of the Galatian believers. The Jews were contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. And Paul said it was necessary to speak the word of God to you first. But now we're turning to the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. But look in verse 50. The Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. So where did Paul go? He went to Iconium. And it says, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, did they receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law? I don't see anything in chapter 13 about works of the law, but I do see where it says, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. That there was faith involved. And those who had faith were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law? No, you received the Holy Spirit by faith, having been appointed. Verse 14, in Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both Jews and Greeks. But what happened? The Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Now do you read anywhere in there about these signs and wonders being done by works of the law? No. It says, but the people of the city were divided and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with the rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe and the surrounding regions. Those are the cities of Galatia. And there they continued to preach the gospel. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him, had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and leaped up and began to walk. Was this man healed by works of the law or by hearing with faith? What says? Paul could see that he had faith to be made well, so he was made well. So what happened? When they saw that they had the power to give this man the ability to walk, 
They said the gods have become like men and have come down to us, and they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes. They were applying their idolatrous understanding of who God was to Paul and Barnabas. And what was Paul's immediate response? He said, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd crying and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach to you the gospel to you that you should turn from these things, these vain things, to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. What did Paul appeal to? to these individuals who had misidentified and mis um, and, and, and worshipped amiss, thinking that Zeus and Hermes were gods. What did Paul appeal to? The first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before you? No, what did he appeal to? Creation. Said God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. That's the one you worship. So Paul didn't even appeal to the law to these individuals. It says, In generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own way, and yet he did not leave himself without a witness. What was the witness that God gave to the nations? The Ten Commandments? The law of God? No, he said what he gave you was rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. He showed himself to be God through the everyday occurrences of man. Verse 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. More persecution. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. <laughs> the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. Paul was quite an amazing individual. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had won and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Now, why do you need to be strengthened? It says, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Why do you need to be encouraged to continue in the faith? Because there's a war going on. The evil one seeks to destroy, and he has his people on earth that will participate in his evil deeds. Persecution and suffering and affliction were the everyday occurrences for the Galatians. So Paul, in spite of being stoned and left for dead, and having been persecuted from city to city in one direction, decides to go back the other way through the same cities that he had been chased from and stoned and left for dead, go back through those same cities for the express purpose of strengthening and encouraging the disciples. Why? They needed it. And Paul was willing to be persecuted if that's what it took to strengthen the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in what? The faith. And saying through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Were the Galatians suffering tribulation? Yes. A few? No, many. The Galatians were suffering many tribulations. And he was encouraging them, saying, that's what has to happen. Hang in there. Be faithful unto death. He appointed elders and prayed for them and commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then they returned to their home church in Antioch. So what was the gospel that Paul preached in Galatia? In chapter 13, verses 38 and 39, 
He says, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. What was Paul's message? Was it a message of keeping the law? No. It was a message that there has been one who has been raised from the dead, and through faith in him, you can be freed from all things that the law of Moses could never have freed you from. Was there persecution in Galatia? Yes, we saw that in verse 45. The Jews stirred up the crowds. In verse 50, they incited the devout women and men to persecute. In chapter 14, verse 2, the disbelieving Jews stirred up the crowd. In verses 5 and 6, they um, were going to stone the, the missionaries. In verses 19 and 22, Paul is stoned and left for dead. And so what kind of life did the Galatians have? In chapter 13, verse 48, it says, Those who had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The life the Galatians had was a life of faith through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Were there signs performed in Galatia? Yes, there were. So now let's look back at Galatians chapter 3 with this historical background. And Paul says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly displayed as crucified? Did Paul publicly display Christ as crucified? Is that Paul's message? Did Paul want to make sure everybody understood it's Christ and Christ crucified and Christ raised from the dead and faith in him that a man stands right before God? Yes. He says, this is the one thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit? Did they receive the Spirit? It says they did. Did they receive the Spirit by works of the law, by hearing with faith? It says very clearly in Acts chapter 13, 14, they received the Spirit by faith, not by works that they had done. So are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Who were the persecutors of the Galatian churches. Jews. Now what are the Jews telling the Galatians? Yes, you must trust Christ, but there if you really want to be a Christian, you have to keep the law, and in particular you have to keep circumcision. If you're not circumcised, you can't really be one of us. He says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Things that you do in your own strength and in your flesh, you can be perfected? Did you suffer so many things in vain? Did they suffer? Yes, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. But did they suffer them in vain? Now think about that one. Think about professing to know Christ, and because of your association with Christ, you are persecuted, but in reality, you never knew Christ. Why would you suffer persecution in vain for no reason? He says, did you suffer so many things in vain? He's wondering whether these individuals truly tasted of God's grace. 
they may have suffered as Christians without being Christians. Paul has something to say about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll get to that in a little while. But he says, if we have believed in Christ for this life only, and there is no resurrection, we are of all men most to be pitied. <laughs> Why? We give up everything in this life for Christ. We receive persecution and affliction and tribulation because of our association with Christ. And in the end, we get nothing. Well, that sounds pretty worthless to me. Doesn't it sound pretty worthless to you? Well, it sounds pretty worthless to Paul, too. If we trust in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Paul is thinking, you guys suffered for things you didn't even need to suffer for because you weren't really believers. He says, if indeed it was in vain, maybe it wasn't. Maybe, maybe you suffered for the right reasons. So then does he provide you with the spirit and work miracles among you? Do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul sought to strengthen and encourage what in the life of the Galatians? Their faith. Where do you read that he left them with a copy of the law and said, here's what you do to remain faithful to God? I don't see that anywhere. What letter did Paul leave with the Galatians? It's called the book of Galatians, right? This was written way after Acts chapter 13 and 14. What did Paul leave with the Galatians? Christ. He's all you need. That is a reality. Did the Galatians need a letter? Yeah, Paul wrote them one. But before that letter came, was Christ enough? Yes, he is. Is the indwelling spirit enough? Yes, he is. Is the word of God necessary? Absolutely. God takes the truth of his word and by the power of his spirit makes it a reality in the heart of his people so that they walk in righteousness. But the question becomes some Judaizers come in and say, yes, faith is good, but not enough. Yes, Christ is good, but not enough. And they add to it works of the law. And were they adding more than circumcision? Yes. Paul says in Galatians, you observe days and months and seasons in years. Where did they get that idea? Where do people celebrate days and months and seasons and years? In the Old Testament. The Jews were commanded to do so. It was a time of great rejoicing and fellowship with God. And it had its purpose. But for the Gentiles? He says, you think by keeping a day, a month, a season, a year, whatever it is, that there's some merit in that before God. What else were the Judaizers teaching? Or maybe even we could say the Apostle Peter. What was he teaching? There are certain foods you're supposed to eat. 
And there are certain foods you're not supposed to eat. Where do you get that? From the Old Testament. From what was commanded to the Jews. Did Paul, do you read anywhere in Acts chapter 13 and 14 on Paul's first missionary journey where he told the Gentiles what foods to eat? Do you read anywhere in those two chapters where Paul spoke of being circumcised in order to have faith in Christ? Do you read anywhere in those two chapters where Paul gave them days, months, seasons, and years to celebrate? No. What do you hear Paul telling them? Christ. He's all you need. So if we look back in Galatians chapter 1, in verse 6, we read, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. You're not even just deserting faith. You're not deserting the, te the teaching of Paul. You're not deserting the teaching of God. You are deserting him. Why is it so tragic that the Galatians were deserting Christ? Because Christ is all you need. Was it in vain? In Acts chapter 4, in verse 5, we read the following. It's not Acts chapter 4, verse 5. Okay, I guess we'll skip that one. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Paul says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. When God does a work in the life of an individual, his grace is not empty. His grace is not for no purpose. His grace accomplishes great and mighty things. And God's grace did not prove vain in Paul's life. What is the demonstration that God's grace was not vain in Paul's life? That he simply trusted Christ? No, he said, I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. I contend here was a man who knew the law and who practiced the law so perfectly that when he stood before other men, he could say as to the righteousness which is found in the law, I was found blameless. And yet that's not what he boasts in here. That's not what he speaks of here. That's not how God's grace was not vain in his life. He doesn't say God's grace was not vain in my life. I kept the law of God. He had already done that and found it to be manure. He says, I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, 
and your faith also is vain. If there's no resurrection, there's no need to preach it. And if your faith is in a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and he hasn't been raised, then what is your faith in? Nothing. And then in verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. You want to have a faith that is not vain? You want to have your life not be something that counts for nothing? Then abound in the work of the Lord. It is because he has been raised from the dead that if you are abounding in the work of the Lord, your toil is not in vain. Is there supposed to be effort and toil and work on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ if there is faith? Absolutely. We are to abound in the work of the Lord knowing that our toil is not in vain in the Lord. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Does that strike you as strange? That you can receive the grace of God and it be in vain? If you add works to it, it's vain. And you can talk about grace all you want, but as soon as you add works to it, it is a vain grace. It is an empty grace. Galatians chapter 2. Paul says he fears that he might be running or had run in vain. He didn't want his work on behalf of the Gentiles to be a vain work. An empty work. So he checked out with the the other apostles and they found that he was preaching the truth of God as well. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, he says, I want you to hold fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. What is Paul's desire for those he preaches to? That they remain faithful unto death. Why? So that he will know that his work that he did on the earth was not a vain work, an empty work, but that it had purpose and meaning. And that individual stand right before God because of the work that he had done. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 4, the verse we're looking at, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Notice what he says in verse 11. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. that I did all this work, I suffered all this tribulation, and what I thought was a new birth was a stillbirth, that you weren't born at all. Because anybody who thinks they can add works to faith has nullified faith. Christ, he's all you need. How can you nullify 
the grace of God. How can you receive the grace of God in vain? Look at verses 8 through 11 in Galatians chapter 4. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. What does Paul mean by elemental things? Things taught in elementary school, the ABCs. What were the ABCs to Paul? The law. He says, when a child is underage, he's treated just like a slave until he becomes of age and he, had, and he receives the adoption as a true son, and then he gets his sonship. Well, while he's still in elementary school, he's treated with the ABCs. Why do you want to go back to the worthless ABCs? He says that in Colossians, too. Why do you want to go back to do not taste, do not handle, do not touch? Why do you want to go back to seasons, months, years? days when you have Christ and he's all you need so what about James after what we've looked at this morning would you think that what is in your bulletin is a strange statement you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone it certainly sounds like Christ isn't all you need. That you need works. Now where would James agree with Paul? And what differences do we see in these two epistles? One reality we need to understand is that both of them are scripture. Both of them are inspired by God. So they cannot be contradicting each other. That we know for sure. But read what it says in Romans chapter 4. And verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And read James chapter 2 and verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. Is a man justified before God by works? No, never. What can we say about Abraham? If he was justified by works, it wasn't before God. Well, then how would Abraham be justified by works? Before men. Isn't that what James said in the passage that we read? Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. It's a demonstration to men that you have genuine saving faith. But it'll never be a demonstration to God. Why? He's the one who saves you in the first place. He's the one who grants you the faith to believe. He's the one who begins the good work in you and makes sure it's perfected. He doesn't need any evidence. He's the one who's orchestrating the whole thing. Sometimes men need evidence of faith. Think of the statement, though, that James makes. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. What does that sound like? To me, that almost sounds self-righteous. I'll show you my faith by my works. You don't have any works. I got more works than you do. I have more faith than you do. 
That's not what James is saying at all. He is trying to bring about a point that there is a way to receive the grace of God in vain. And if you receive the grace of God in vain, you will either try to add some sort of merit of your own to it, or you will deny the reality that you're a changed individual and you walk in righteousness. Again, Satan's not concerned with which way you go, just so long as you go one way or the other and stay away from trusting Christ. But you know what's interesting? If I were to say something like, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works, what do you think the works James is talking about is? If you just hear the word works, what do you think? Works of the law, right? I'll show you how I keep the Ten Commandments. I'll show you how I keep circumcision. I'll show you how I keep the Sabbath. I'll show you how I keep the tithe. I'll show you how I keep days, months, seasons, and years. I'll show you how I keep all of it. There's nothing like that in the book of James. You know what James says is pure and undefiled religion? Visiting widows and orphans in their need. What is that a demonstration of? Love. These people can't pay you back. If you show kindness to widows and orphans, it's not because you're expecting anything in return because you're not getting anything in return. They have nothing to give you back. That is love. What else does he talk about? A rich man comes into your church and you sit him on the front row and a poor man comes in your church and you sit him on the back row. He says, have you not made distinctions with evil motives? What are the evil motives? You don't love each man equally. You love one man because of the way he looks, and you don't love the other man because of the way he looks. That's evil. You should practice what? Love. What else does James talk about? He says, somebody in need comes to your door and they don't have food and clothing and the needs of life. And you tell them, be warmed, be filled. Okay, um, how do you expect me to do that? Well, just be warmed and be filled. I'll send you on your way now. But you don't give them anything to be warmed with, no coat. You give them nothing to be filled with, no sandwich. What does James say? How does the love of God abide in that individual? What are the works that James is talking about? Works of love. He's not talking about works of the law. He's not talking about keeping 10 commandments, 12 commandments, 45 commandments, 613 commandments. He's not talking about any of that at all. He's talking about loving your neighbor as yourself. He even says, he even calls it the royal law of love. If there is any commandment, it is summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. Now, did Paul teach that? Did Paul teach that if you are genuinely born again, you will practice love toward your neighbor? Yes. He taught the exact same thing that James teaches. But we can pull verses out of context and make them sound altogether different than they were intended. So you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Basically what James is saying is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the 
tongues of men and angels, if I give my body to be burned, if I do this, 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 but I don't have love, it profits me nothing, and I am nothing. I am vain. My faith is vain. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But an individual who has truly been touched by the grace of God will practice love for his neighbor and love for his God. Is Christ all you need? Yes. But when you get Christ, you are a changed individual. All things are new. You are a new creation. You have been born again. And you will have the law of God written on your heart. And you will instinctively love your neighbor. James and Paul say the same thing as far as I can see. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would be pleased to work in our hearts, that we would love the Lord our God with all of our mind, soul, strength, and heart, and that we'd love our neighbors ourselves. that we would recognize that we love because you first loved us, and that we would have the indwelling Holy Spirit working in us with your commandments written on our hearts, that as the Lord Jesus Christ gave commandment to his apostles, that we might love one another even as he has loved us, and that those who